Well, I judged a couple of you, not in this class, but the mock trial. Did everyone do the round last week? Yes. Okay, I hope you did well. I see some people dressed up nicely, which I think when you advance, so congratulations to you. Uh, but uh, hopefully you all do well. Uh, any questions, anything in your mind from last class? I have a question. Yes, sir. In the email you said to read the answer, can you post the answer? Oh, yeah, I'll get there in a second. Any okay. questions other than the term? Anything else about the content? Um, I'm trying to use the that. I'll show you. But thank you for asking. So, um, I'm almost done with your midterm. They'll be ready to pick up on Monday. So a week from yesterday, they'll be ready. Common law property will be over in the same day. We'll finish up this weekend, but they're they're almost done. Again, no one failed, so no one to worry anything. Uh, but there's definitely grounds for uh, improvement. Um, I sent you um, this link, which I'll show you what it's supposed to look like. Uh, it's a it's a platform called Doodle, which I've been using for the past couple semesters. What I've done is I posted. 114 time slots between now and the end of November. So basically between now and I think November 13th or 14th. Um, you have to sign up for one. About 40 of you have already signed up between my two sections, so it's doable. Ignore the cat advertising, so we'll ignore that for a second. <laughs> uh, so the way it works is you put your name in here. I also want you to write John Smith, property two, and your exam number. Uh, the reason why I want you to do this is it makes it very easy for me to pull up your exam in advance. Otherwise, I have to check like, three spreadsheets to match your number, your name, and just adds more complications for me. So if you scroll through here, you will see all the various time slots that are open. Now, if you scroll through, a lot of them have this like, little eye next to it with a line through it that means it's not available. But if you keep scrolling, keep scrolling, keep scrolling, you will find slots that are available. See a little check mark? So you check that right there, November 7th at 8.30. Right? You put your name in here, hit submit. Uh, I'm not going to do it because I don't want to waste the slot. Uh, please make sure you write on your calendar when your slot is. I won't remind you. If you miss your slot, you go back to the bottom of the queue and you have to pick another one. Um, you'll notice that if you didn't sign up quickly, a lot of the good spots are taken. Uh, what I'm doing is I'm basically going to sit in my office for about 12 hours from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. If you don't sign up promptly, you will probably get a 9 p.m. slot. I'm sorry, but that, that's how it works. Uh, but that's the only way I can see all my hundred and I think five or six students in both sections. So uh, encourage you to sign up. As I'm saying, this one just signed up a minute ago, so I see someone's paying attention. Good. Um, but take your slots, sign up for a position. Um, bring your paper with you. I am amazed every year when students come to go over their exams and don't have their paper with them. It makes it very hard for me to actually review your paper when you don't have it. So please bring it. Um, Probably by Monday morning, I will post the exam itself and the A-plus paper. Um, I want you to review both of them, and I want you to compare your paper to the A-plus. Now, the A-plus isn't perfect. In fact, I graded it. It got an 80, well, it got 43 out of 50, which is basically an 86. So it's not even close to 100. So it's possible that you got stuff the A-plus didn't and vice versa. doesn't mean you're perfect or not, but that's a model of what you should expect. I've, I've never given 100. I think I once had a 97 or 98. That, that was an oddity, but I've, I've never actually had a perfect paper. It hasn't happened yet. Maybe, maybe this year it will. Maybe it'll surprise you. <coughs> it hasn't happened yet. Mark? How are we supposed to bring our paper? Yeah. When you pick up your exam, it'll mm -hmm. happen. Okay. See, when I say I'll give you back your exam, I mean I'll give you back your exam, right? It'll be your paper that you wrote with, with your grade on it, okay. and that's what you'll get. Other questions? But so far, they're pretty good. I mean, don't don't be worried. There's there's definitely room for improvement, but I was um, I don't think there's any cause for panic. Uh, th there was, again, no failure. No one was just absolutely completely off the mark. Everyone had at least some semblance that they've been awake in class this semester and were paying attention somewhat. There were some very good papers, some bad papers, but nothing was like causing me to freak out. I think everyone is, is on more or less the right, right trajectory, which I'm happy about. Not, that's not the case every semester. If you go back and you watch my videos from years past where like I'm giving back the papers, my face is often very different than it is now. So this is a phase of, okay, you guys are doing okay. It's not the, oh, guys, you're screwed. So, you know, <laughs> chalk it up to whatever you want, but uh, you're, you're more or less on the right track. Uh, a couple of you, just warning you, 
the reason why there are some, movie, some very bad grades is actually the word limits. Several of you just totally blew them. Um, that, that's going to be the reason why. So when you see your paper, you'll know who you are. Yes, Mon? Ask the registrar. I mean, I, the, the, the point of the anonymous grading is I'm not supposed to know who you are. I can find it out, but I have to check like a couple different sources. It's, it's, it's for your protection. So if you don't know what it is, what's going to happen is on Monday morning, I'll say, go to Cindy Lowermore. Her office is right across the hall from mine. Pick up your exam. She won't have your name. She'll have a number. So if you don't know your number, go ask the registrar, and they'll give it to you. Okay. You, you might want to do that in advance of Monday. That way, like you're not just running to Cindy. Like, oh my God, what's my number? I don't know. So just do that this week, and I'll take care of it. Okay. I got mine. Okay. Good. Perfect. Thank you, Adam. Yeah. So 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 that's what you got to do. Yes. I have a word limit question. So if there's a thousand word limit, can you do three hundred for one answer and two hundred? You for can another? divide up however okay. you want, but I stop reading at word one thousand one. Just making sure. Yeah. I I, I stop reading at word one thousand one. So what invariably happens is if you burn the word limit on the final question, you get zero out of ten. That 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 that's what happens. So you, it's announced, you know about it, and it's there. Any substantive questions on zoning or property law, not just the midterm? No. All right, let's, oh yes, sir, Bradley. Will you uh, just touch on briefly the difference between covenants or not covenants? Um, Special exceptions and variances. Yeah, I'm actually going to cover that again today, but but I'll, I'll do it briefly here. A variance is going to be an exception to land use based on a hardship, right? Specifically, it's something that is not predictable. The legislature couldn't have conceived that this problem would arise, so they give the zoning board discretion on a case by case <coughs> basis to make carve outs. The special exception, what's also called a conditional use permit, a CUP, don't, don't make any jokes, a conditional use permit every year. Um, the chuckles every year with that fail. Um, good, thank you, Lauren. You're, 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 you're a decent human being. Uh, a conditional use permit or a special exception is a um, problem that's predictable, right? The legislature said, we know that this is going to happen, so we'll allow the zoning board to grant this in the event that X, Y, and Z factors are met. In fact, the case we're doing today, the church case, right? I'm sorry, the uh, the, 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 the Guru Nanak case, it involves a conditional use permit of whether you can build a house of worship in a given area. So it's not like a variant which is unpredictable. The, the defining characteristic of the special exception is the legislature knows in advance what's going to happen and gives you X, Y, Z. Here are the factors you have to satisfy. Yeah. Don't confuse the two. They're different. Uh, the different different standards for each. The reason why the difference matters is that with a variance, they have a lot of discretion. Of, is there a hardship, right? You can't, it's very difficult to legislate what a hardship is. It's going to be case by case. But when you get to the special exception, they do give very concrete factors. And it cabins, it limits the discretion of the zoning board. They can't have, you know, the discretion to do whatever they want. They have to stay within certain bounds. If they go too far, that's actually unconstitutional. We discuss this. It's delegating legislative power to the zoning board. No go. So with variances, they have a lot of discretion. With these special exceptions, also called conditional use permits, they have less discretion. Is that good? What you need to know? Absolutely. Yes, sir. Other questions? <laughs> yes, David. Uh, but the, does ordinance have to actually list? Like, we will allow, um, if conditions are met, we will allow churches. Or, like, does that have to? Like, yeah. Yeah, the, the essence, the important aspect of a special exception, or it's called conditional use permit, is you spell it out in the statute. You have to spell it out with specificity. You can't just leave it to some other board to determine. Yes, other questions before we get started? Okay, let's do a question. I'm going to close this. If you have difficulty signing up for a time slot, just email me and I'll help you. But it's it's pretty straightforward. and. Um, uh, the slots are going quickly, so unless you want to be stuck seeing me at 9 p.m., go, go put in a slot. I'm not going to remind you after this, so it's, it's on you. Um, and by the way, if you don't make an appointment, I will make one for you, and it'll probably be at 9 o'clock. So do it on your own convenience. Don't, don't force me to do this for you. All right, let's do a question. 
here's your question for today. And this is going to be a bridge between uh, the Leduc case we studied last week and the um, uh, a Reed v. Town of Gilbert case for today. So here's your question. A regulation prohibiting all signs in a town, all signs, would be unconstitutional. True or false? That's your question. A regulation prohibiting all signs in a town would be unconstitutional. True or false? Another 10 to 15 seconds. seconds. Okay. All right. Who's up next? Robert? What's your answer there? Um, I put false. Okay. Why did you put false? Uh, I don't remember exactly what the rule was, but I think uh, the issue was that it was specific to uh, the content and uh, content neutral uh, prohibition on all signs seems like it would be allowed. Mm. Okay, William, what you put, William? I was put false. Okay, good. Why you put false? Um, same concept. I thought it was content neutral, but like to me, the issue was whether or not it's over regulation. But then, doesn't this shut down on a lot of different avenues for speech? Isn't the sign like a very cheap, easy way of expressing your ideas? Yeah, and that that was my concern is whether or not. It, I guess it covers too much speech. Is what it covers it too much speech. Kaylee? Um, I put true because okay. it's, it's very um, over-inclusive. Over-inclusive? How so? It's not narrowly tailored. You know, um, like every, every business is a choice to have to put up some signs. You have to have directional signs, you know, like traffic. And that's, a, that's definitely a safety concern. So Mark, what, what do you think? I, I also put false just because I felt like it wasn't content based and as long as you as long as you prohibit all signs to does it matter what it's concerning it'd be constitutional yeah. oh did I call on you twice Mrs. Godera aren't I well yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. well I called on you twice I'm sorry I always in my other classes one student always there who yells me whenever I go back to him twice so uh, you're <laughs> Casey you're up what, now what, what, what's, what's your answer here um, I think true uh -huh. I can't tell you why So I'll synthesize what some of you are saying, right? So some of you are saying, well, it's content neutral, right? It's not saying you can have political signs, but not directional signs. It's not saying that you can have, um, you know, signs for churches, but you can't have signs for car washes, right? So it's content neutral. And in that sense, you're correct. What's called strict scrutiny, we only trigger it when an ordinance is content neutral, when it separates different kinds. But this law is different. It makes no distinction based on content. It's purely what we call content neutral. It makes no distinction based on the content. Every one, every sign is prohibited. But then I think Kaylee, I think, I think Casey are on a similar page here. They're saying, wait a minute. This is shutting down all matter of speech, and even speech that might be important for directions, right? Police power. Try going down a street. If there are no signs, you won't know where to go. Right? So what we have here in this case is two different concepts, right? Which I think a couple of you alluded to. We have what's called over-inclusiveness. Over-inclusiveness. And the second one is under-inclusiveness. And these are concepts that pop up a lot in free speech cases, right? This, this statute is <coughs> over-inclusive to the maximum, right? It banned all manner of speeches, all manner of communication. In contrast, the case we have next, the, 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 real, the town of Gilbert case, 
is very under-inclusive, right? It allows these types of signs, but not those types of signs. So when a statute is under-inclusive, you get suspicious, like, huh, why are you allowing these speeches, but not those speeches, right? Is the government favoring one over the other? But here, we only have the problem of over-inclusiveness. Okay? Now, my, my own personal answer here, and I think that the answer in um, uh, uh, Reed supports this, I think that statute would be fine. I think it would be an absolutely awful idea. <laughs> but I think it would be constitutional. Because if the government really wants to eliminate clutter, they can ban the posting of all signs, right? And maybe they can say, we, the government, will post directional signs, and that's it. We don't want anyone to be cluttered with their view of uh, 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 nature, right? We don't want to clutter the, 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 the pristine wilderness of our, of our neighborhood, right? Um, I don't think this would raise concerns uh, under the First Amendment, precisely because it's so over-inclusive. What gets you in trouble is a combination of both over-inclusiveness, that you're banning a lot of speech, and under-inclusiveness, you're letting some stuff through. Right? If you ban a lot, but let certain things through, that's an indication that you're doing it for improper motives. So I think actually this statute would be fine. Um, and you can imagine, maybe this wouldn't work in Houston, but let's say you have a, um, uh, let's say you have a town that has you know, a lot of nature and a lot of wilderness, and they don't want any signs to be posted that can obscure the view of nature. And they can simply say, uh, no signs can be posted anywhere. Right? If you want to have an awning right on your business with a little sign there, that's fine, but, but no signs on the street at all. I think that'd be okay. I think it'd be a crazy sign and it would probably drive the people of that community nuts of trying to comply with it. But I don't think that raises First Amendment concern. Let's see how it happens. So I, I think it's I think this is false. Let's see. Whoa, look at that. Okay. Good. Good job. I think I think 80 something percent got the question uh, right. But but the the other percent, I think you were also on the right track. This was a hard question. I think I think you guys more or less got this. Okay. But yes, yeah, jump on. The, the over inclusiveness uh, for specific signs for the kind of market kind of or is... Give me an example. I think I know what you guys. Give me an example. I mean, if you want to uh, uh, present uh, in three points today, you don't necessarily create a sign. No. And put it on Facebook. Website that most people, I mean, the majority of Americans have a Facebook. Uh, is Facebook a public forum? Is Twitter a public forum to which the First Amendment attaches? No. Why, why do you say no? Okay, it's owned by private companies. So, can Twitter and Facebook censor your message, say, you know what, John Paul, we think you're an idiot and we think your views are dumb and we're just going to not display them anywhere. Yes, we can. Can you sue them for violation of your civil rights? No, you can't. No, you can't. So the, the short answer to your question is that forums like Facebook and Twitter um, are not public forums. Um, a, a, a closer example, which is somewhat related to this, is um, let's say that you're an internet provider. Right, Comcast, whatever. Um, can you discriminate based on traffic? That is, can you say, uh, we're going to let these packets go through our network faster than those packets? Right, so say Verizon has a deal with Netflix. You say, okay, if you're watching Netflix, we'll let you stream <coughs> really fast. But if you're on Hulu, right, we're going to make it go real slow because people go to Netflix instead. So this this is this is a general concept I've mentioned because you raise it called net neutrality, the notion that our internet providers uh, require to be neutral to different types of traffic on their on their networks. Um, and, and this is being litigated now and actually litigation is probably gonna end soon because the incumbent administration has wound back those uh, provisions. Um, but the question is, are phone companies like Verizon and Comcast who are internet services like the phone company, right? You know, like, like the water company, power company, the common carriers. So even if I think it's safe to say that, that Twitter and Facebook are not public entities, there's a fairly strong current in American law suggesting that internet providers that carry the traffic are. Uh, yes, Thomas? 
could could the government fire like a governmental employee for like posting things on Facebook? I mean, yes. So, um, have any of you ever worked for the government before? No, Isaac, please. Isaac, do you have a social media guideline from the HPD of what you can and cannot post? Uh, we have the official one, which is super vague, um, yeah. because they want to be able to control it. Yeah. Uh, and the, uh, the unofficial one, which says don't do anything that would embarrass the department. And what happens if you go post a video of you, I don't know, arresting a guy and say, ha ha, I, I nailed this guy, right? Well, that's, uh, that would get you popped for sound judgment. Uh, yeah, if it would. Pop being fired or disciplined? Uh, probably depends on the exact circumstances, but it uh, wouldn't be good either way. Wasn't there a sheriff, I don't think it was in Harris County, but a sheriff in, in this area who got in trouble with Facebook in the last couple of years? There's still a lot of officers. Yeah, it, so, so the short answer to your question is if you work for the government, um, even though you're, you're posting stuff on your private time, if it can call into question your um, independence and your ability to do your job in an honest fashion, um, you can probably be disciplined. There's an entire area of law which is far afield from this about what are speech rights of government workers. And there's a case law suggesting that if you're a government worker, you can write uh, articles critical of the government. Um, that is in certain bounds, but you can't do other stuff. So if you want to write an op-ed, right, criticizing your boss, you can do that. Um, they can't retaliate against you. But if you go and put a picture of you arresting a guy on Facebook, say, hi, I got this guy, he's going to jail, you're probably getting in trouble. But you don't have to work for the government for that to be the case, right? Oh, private employers can do whatever the hell they want, right? If, if, you have a, if, you, if you're a private employer and you find that your employee is posting dumb stuff on Facebook, um, you you can punish them. There might be some uh, uh, union issues, labor issues, um, pretty big field. Uh, but but uh, protests during sporting events, for example, right? Uh, it's not First Amendment. It's a private entity, and they can protest they wish. But there might be labor issues and union stuff, which is different. Jesse, we might already address this, but uh, I thought that whether or not something is over inclusive, under inclusive, that. Uh, it should be based on really the standard of review, and if it's rational basis. Well, you only get to questions of over inclusiveness or under inclusiveness if you're in the strict scrutiny land, right? Or you scrutiny. only you only get there here if it's talking about a content-based restriction. One more question to move on. Anyone else? All right, let's move on. So the first case we have today um, is a fairly recent case. It's so recent it's not even in your book which I know law students love reading stuff outside the book, so I'll give you a fairly short excerpt. I suspect when the, the beloved ninth edition of your book comes out in a month or so, it will be in there, and they'll probably cut Ledoux, but I have you read it for now. So um, who wants to, okay, who's next? Uh, Antonella, yes, ma'am. Can you give me the facts, please, and read me Town of Gilbert? Sure, so the pastor was three, Good. and um, he's part of the Good News Community Church, but okay. they didn't have an official establishment, so they kind of... Uh, an establishment religion, get it? <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Let's see. Yeah, go ahead. So they moved around from different buildings in the town, and whenever they did, they would put out a sign saying, we're having a, our next When When did they put those signs up? When, when would they do that? So, I know the regulation said it can't be more than 12 hours. Yeah, yeah, so did they put up the signs in advance of the, of the meeting of the church? Yes, they would. And how long do the signs stick around for? For a while. Right. So you can imagine the problem here, right? You have a church that's itinerant. <laughs> that is, it doesn't have a fixed place of worship. They move around from week to week. Now, perhaps the way to advertise this is on Twitter and on Facebook, but um, an old school conventional way of telling people to go to church is to put up a sign saying, hey, this week our church meeting will be in this location, and this week our church meeting will be in that location, right? And these are just regular signs you put up on the side of the road. They're not expensive. They're, they're, they're pretty cheap to put up. Um, but this town enacted a strange ordinance, right? So Stormy, with respect to the church signs, what were the restrictions imposed on, the, on these displays? Well, so um, they couldn't be more than six square feet, and they had to be put up no earlier than 12 hours before the event. And Good. they had to be taken down within the hour after the event. Okay, so just realistically speaking, they have to be six square feet, which is actually not that big. It, it's a pretty small sign. They have to put up no earlier than 12 hours before the event and taken down within an hour. So let's just say, make it easy. Church services begin at 10 a.m. on Sunday morning, right? Pretty small. At what point they put the sign up for that? Um, 
10 yeah, so you can only put the sign up at 10 p.m. Saturday night. Who in the world will be driving around Saturday night at 10 p.m.? Ah, church, right? No. <laughs> and then you have to take it down in an hour, which means basically you have to run from the church, yank the sign up all over town, or else you get it with a fine. Right? So Tyler, what's problematic about that, this regime? Why is it problematic? Well, it's limiting the type of speech that they're allowed to but is this controlling the message on the sign? Is there any way restricting what the message can say? Well, it just kind of, it, it kind of is prohibiting the message in a certain time frame, so in that sense, yes. Yeah. But does the ordinance say anything about what types of messages can be displayed? Yes. Oh, Delilah? Um, no. But they do allow for political <coughs> Oh, tell me about that, please. What kind of so what kind of signs were exempt from this twelve hour rule? Um, I thought it was just essentially like political Yeah. So Delilah, let me ask you this question. If you have a sign saying, you know, vote for Joe Smith, right? Or um, I love John Locke, right? I like that sign, right? Are you bound by this 12-hour rule? So let me ask the question again, as a Tyler, is this regime content-based? It is. It is content-based, right? If it meets certain types of content requirements, you're subject to this 12-hour rule. If you meet other types of content requirements, you're not subject to this 12-hour rule, right? If you put a sign that says, elect Joe Smith, that content gets you free. You can pick up a bigger sign and keep it around for longer. But if your sign says um, church services on Sunday at 10 a.m., then you are subject to this other regime where basically your sign's worthless. You have to post it 12 hours before, which, I mean, frankly, for Sunday morning church service, if you're posting a sign at 12, 10 a.m., that's, that's not going to get you any people in the door. Or if you put it up, I love church, that sign would not be subject to it. So we're going to see the problem here, right? Depending on the content of the sign that you want to post, different sets of rules apply. Okay, everyone well, with me so far? <clears throat> on the face of this law, on its face, it draws a distinction between different types of messages. Okay? And this is what triggers strict scrutiny, which we've discussed last week, right? The court looks at it very carefully to see that maybe the reason why this regime exists is because they don't like churches. Maybe not, maybe it is. Okay? Now, the reason why this opinion is somewhat difficult is it's very fractured. Um, Justice Thomas was assigned majority opinion, and, and if you know this from Kamala, Justice Thomas has a very tough time keeping together majority opinions. He very for fractures, because uh, he's very specific and direct who wants to uh, choose. So he got five votes, which is actually somewhat rare for him. He very rarely has five more opinions. But the other justices fracture off. So I want to walk through each of the opinions separately. Anna, what is Justice Thomas's analysis? Just describe it for me, please. Um, basically, the court said that Anna, what reason exists to allow political signs to be bigger than directional signs? What what reason could it possibly be for this for this rule? The busy bodies, be nice, Isaac. What do we call them? Neighbors, community members. The busy bodies are trying to uh, comply with the First Amendment by granting favored status to uh, political speech. Why? 
because they are trying their best in their own convoluted way to to, uh, <laughs> to do this to, in order to uh, even benefit themselves. Is that what you're getting at? Well, I, if I could find a way to to say that, I probably would. But uh, right. So I, th I think what Isaac's getting at is uh, in his is his charmful way. Uh, uh, is that the sorts of signs permitted are those that the people in the community are likely to post, right? People are likely in that community to put signs on their lawn for a candidate, they likely to put a sign on the lawn saying no to war, but they're not likely to put directional signs, they just never have to do it. So they're trying to allow speech that they like and make it harder for speech they don't. Um, another reason, and you probably know this after any primary election, how long do political signs stay in the rows for? Forever. <laughs> Forever. I mean, there, there's a convention that says you should take down your signs the day after the election, but generally the losing candidate is sick and tired just want to deal with that stuff, right? They're, basically his entire campaign is banned. So there might be a thing saying, well, unless we make the strip, you sign it's there up forever. Anna? Uh, when you say directional signs, are you talking about street signs? No, I mean like oh, directions from the churches. Not, like... No, I mean like church services that way. Right. Signs the government puts up themselves are not subject to this, right? You know, one way stop sign, that's different. So what Thomas basically says is um, we're gonna be applying strict scrutiny. Ideological signs are treated better than these sorts of temporary directional signs. And because there are too many exemptions to the law, the government's compelling interest is implausible. Thomas does permit the possibility that you could have certain certain types of um, <coughs> safety signs that would be allowed, but he says once you start discriminating, the basis of content is void. Right? Thomas's opinion is easiest to explain. Jesse, what's uh, Alito, joined by Kennedy and Sotomayor, uh, saying? Um, I mean, they're saying that well, they give a lot of examples of signs that uh, would. So what kind of content-based restrictions would the would Alito and uh, uh, would Alito allow? Uh, Limiting speech based on its topic or subject. Um, that when it says they don't want to disturb the status quo, they give a couple of rationales. Um, yeah, but saying you know to preserve an uninhibited marketplace of ideas, remove the jail, and uh, the government shouldn't regulate speech based on distill your favoritism. Jesse, could the government have a law that says um, you can't have an illuminated billboard unless it's giving safety messages? That is, you know, you see the billboards like they're like, like the LED screens that light up. What if it said you can't have an illuminated billboard unless it provides a safety message? It is based on content. It is based on content. But does Alito think that would pass constitutional muster? Uh, he does. That's why he gives a bunch of examples of what he thinks would, would be appropriate. That was one of the examples. Right? So what, what Alito is saying is you can have a content-based restriction in certain narrowly defined circumstances, basically if it's about public safety. Right? If you have a, a sign that says, um, you know, hazard ahead, right? That you can have with a light on it. But if it's just a sign for Coca-Cola, you perhaps couldn't. Yeah, Bradley. So just generally, excuse me, like for presidential effect, the majority opinion is the only one that's like, that's absolute law, and then concurrence are like... Oh, uh, wouldn't that be easy? No. Um, and, and this case in particular is, is, again, very difficult. I caution you, whenever you see a Justice Thomas opinion, it usually makes more sense for the concurring opinions than the majority opinions. He, he cannot hold the majority opinion. It's very tough for him. He just doesn't do it. Uh, they always fracture off. So I think the, the sort of bright line rule that Thomas adopted is, I like settings, I agree with it, but uh, it's hard to make that apply elsewhere. And, and the, the key is that Kennedy concurred with Alito, and that's generally a sign saying that the, there's more give. But you're welcome to cite the majority opinion, uh, but I don't know how far it gets you. Um, this was a really big opinion, the Kagan dissent, well, it's not really a dissent, but it's a concurring dissent um, makes makes reason why the majority opinion goes pretty far. So the majority then isn't necessarily. It has five votes, so it's a majority opinion. But your question is, what about for future cases? I don't know if that five vote block remains. 
Travis, what's Breyer saying? Uh, he says that content discrimination shouldn't always trigger strict scrutiny. Why not? That in some instances it makes sense. But he gives some examples like the regulation of securities and energy conservation and things like that where it doesn't make sense. Yeah, Justice Breyer, um, pardon me for studying too much, but he hates any sort of formal test. The idea of strict scrutiny makes him very upset. Um, his essence of being is, is proportionality, balancing. How do we balance this and balance that? And if you ever um, listen to his questions during oral arguments, he puts together these eight-factor balancing tests that make very little sense to anyone but him. But this is what he sincerely believes to be the, the proper application of constitutional law. Um, and here's one of them. He says, the better approach is to treat content discrimination as a strong reason, weighing against the constitutionality of a rule. Okay. He asks whether the regulation at issue works harm to First Amendment interests that is disproportionate in light of the relevant regulatory objectives. What does it mean for an interest to be disproportionate in light of the relevant regulatory objectives? He lists factors. You examine the seriousness of the harm to speech, the importance of the countervailing objectives, the extent to which the law will achieve those objectives, and whether there are other less restrictive ways of doing so. Um, I don't know how to apply those. Um, I, I pity the lower court judge who tries to, uh, but, but that's uh, Justice Breyer's opinion, which only one person joined, and that's Justice Breyer. <laughs> it's, it's, this is very common. You, if you follow these cases, that, that, that's, that's usually what happens. Alex, let's talk about the Kagan opinion. I think that's actually where the most uh, effort we put. It's Kagan, she concurred in judgment, right? So she agreed that this statute was unconstitutional, but she did not join the majority's analysis. Why? I thought that we should relax the whole standard there, that kind of city is exempt uh, certain categories of signs. Uh, a lot of helpful signs will fall under strict scrutiny, so we should relax the standard. Right, and so what Kagan's saying here, I think she has actually a very good point. There are a lot of laws that, in regulating signs, take into consideration content. And she gives the example, right? Um, George Washington slept in this house, right? If you have some sort of historical sign, you can put it up there with that permission. But if you don't, if it's not historical, you need special permission. So Kagan's like, look, if we accept the majority's opinion, we're basically over here, right? That's why I led off with this question. If we accept the majority's opinion, the, sound, the town basically has a choice. They can allow all messages, which creates clutter, or they can allow zero messages to avoid content discrimination. Okay? What Kagan's saying here, I think she has a fair point, is that you shouldn't have to put the, the, the government to this, this sort of burden. There should be some sort of middle of the road area to allow them to make certain types of content-based restrictions. Right? That is, if you make an exemption for uh, safety signs, um, certain sale signs in residential areas, that's fine. Because once you take the majority opinion to say that all content discrimination is unconstitutional, you're basically here. You ban all signs, you ban no signs. Um, otherwise, you have to basically water down strict scrutiny, which I think is what Alito is getting at. So um, I think Bradley asked this question a minute ago. Uh, I suspect that in a different case involving safety signs, Kagan's view would actually prevail. I don't think there are five votes to go full Thomas here. Um, usually aren't. But here at least, in this case, because the statute was so egregious, Thomas got five votes. He got six votes, actually, right? Why? Kagan says, this doesn't pass strict scrutiny. I love this line. It doesn't pass strict scrutiny or intermediate scrutiny or even the laugh test. I actually use that line in a brief. I love that line. Um, this makes no sense, right? If you have a sign of a politician, it can be really big and be around forever. If it's a sign for a church, it can be really small and be around for only 12 hours. So the statute here was, was a really bad statute. In fact, if you go and you listen to the arguments, I listened to them. The lawyer for the town of Gilbert puts in trouble, right? You're going to have this at some point in your career where you're defending a law that's really stupid and makes no sense. And this poor guy listening to twist and turn trying to defend the statute, he basically had no reason. 
they asked him, so why do you allow bigger signs for politicians and smaller signs for churches? And like, his answer made no sense. I mean, he said something. He, words came out of the guy's mouth, but there, there was you know, no coherent argument. And I mean, it wasn't his fault, right? It's not like he was a bad lawyer, but his case was bad, and he lost 9-0. Um, what probably should have happened here is they should not have even appealed. They should have just said, okay, we give up. We're going to repeal the statute, right? They should just repeal the ordinance. Uh, but instead they lost, and they're going to pay attorney's fees. Because when you litigate these cases and you lose, you pay fees. So there was a cost to the town of Gilbert for defending this stupid law. That's where we are. Nine zero lost. How expensive are attorneys fees? Oh, a lot. Oh God, Professor Finnegan. <laughs> when you litigate a case up to the Supreme Court, we're talking the hundreds of thousands of dollars, right? This is you know, start the district court, circuit court, Supreme Court. The printing costs alone are thousands of dollars. Right? You don't know this, but like. When you submit a brief to the Supreme Court, you have to get a print on a special paper with a special size, a special color. It's really expensive. You have to print what's called the appendix, which is like this big, thick book with all the various records from below. I, a case like this, I can actually probably look it up later if you're curious, but I'm guessing it's in the hundreds of thousands. That sound reasonable? Yeah, I mean, if you look at some of the, uh, the same-sex marriage litigation, it was like in the millions, right? If you add up all the various litigations, they're like millions of dollars. So. There's a cost to defending a stupid statute in all the way up upstairs because you can your taxpayers aren't the hook for this. They they won't know about this, but they will pay for it eventually. So because they have these beautiful signs taking down in 12 hours, now they have to pay a couple hundred grand in, in fees. And this was a pro bono case too. The lawyers who took this was a uh, group that represents churches very often. So they were doing this pro bono. Pro bono often means contingency, right? We do it for free unless you win, which we collect our fees. Um, is it you only pay your own attorney fees? No, 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 no. no. When, 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 when the government loses a case like this, is a shift, right? You shift the fees onto the plaintiff, and the plaintiff then gets their fees covered. Right? The government pays their own bills no matter what, right? Um, but here, uh, in this case, they pay the plaintiff's lawyers. And not just fees, cost also. Filing, printing, right? There, there are certain costs to litigate as well. Travel, right? That's applied to Washington for the hearing, like their hotels. This stuff, this stuff adds up. There's, there's an entire body of litigation about how to calculate what a reasonable attorney's fee is, right? Because you can say, oh yeah, my my billable hourly rate is a thousand dollars an hour, and the judge says, no, 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 that's too high, and then judges often adjust your rate. But keep keep your bills, keep your rate. And one of the Doesn't that somewhat imply that she's saying that there is a specific idea that's correct and that you should allow for a place only when the correct idea can be ah, thank you. So, so there's this notion um, that the First Amendment is designed to correct the marketplace of ideas. This is often attributed to Olive Wendell Holmes. Of course, he didn't make it up. No one ever makes it up himself, but it's usually given to Holmes. Um, the idea that the idea of marketplaces, I'm sorry, the marketplace of ideas signals there's a truth, um, doesn't mean taking and saying one side of it is true. It's that when you have different factors, factions are really competing, the best answer will come out of it. Um, now, most people think there's only one truth, otherwise, you know, what's philosophical, what is truth, right? <coughs> but I don't think they're actually saying that only one side is true. All right, any other questions on um, Read the town of Gilbert, right? So I think going back to Bradley's question, what's the, what's the holding of the case? Um, a content-based restriction on signs is probably unconstitutional. Um, almost certainly. I didn't say always, but almost certainly it's gonna be unconstitutional because it's based on the content. Yeah, Bradley. Okay, any other questions on the first case? Anything else on the first case? Okay, so we're done with First Amendment free speech. Now we move on to religion. See, we're doing this in sequence. We'll do speech, 
with your religion, and they'll finish up with association, right? All of the ways the First Amendment puts limits on zoning. That's why these cases are clustered today. So I always have to ask, did you cover uh, religion in uh, common law? Yeah. Okay, I can work with that. I can work with that. Um, so our starting point, right? Our starting point with the First Amendment is the Free Exercise Clause, right? It provides, Congress shall make no law prohibiting the free exercise of religion. Right? Now, what does that mean, the free exercise of religion? Um, the court has taken different understandings of this clause. In the most recent case, the one that's most relevant to you, the court took a very narrow view of the clause. So did you read the case of un oh, sorry, Employment Division versus Smith? Yes. OK, good. So I'll, no, I didn't. I'll summarize this fine. This case arose from Oregon. You had a guy named Al Smith who was Native American. And part of his religious sacrament was peyote. You know, peyote is right, it's this cactus hallucinogenic thing, right? It's a it's a drug, it's a control substance. Um, he was fired from his job because he was doing uh, a peyote as part of his religious sacrament. Now, um, his job was actually as a drug counselor, which people sometimes chuckle at. But he actually used his faith to help him get clean and get, get up other types of substance abuse. This was his, his background. Uh, he was fired from his job. He then applied for unemployment benefits. He was denied unemployment benefits. And the reason why he was denied is that he was using a controlled substance, which is a violation of both state and federal law. He sued, saying, aha, you can't deny me these benefits because that's violating my free exercise, right? That I have this right to exercise my religion, and denying me these benefits runs afoul of that. Does anyone remember what the court did there? They denied him. They denied him. Why? Remember? Because they restrict all drug use, not, they're not, it's not based on religion. Exactly. So the court denied the claim, and the reason why is that this law was in no way singling out any one faith. It applied across the board. Whether you are a Native American using peyote or a member of the church of cannabis, lighting up a joint, it didn't matter. Because that's a real thing. People made this church of marijuana, that's the thing, right? Uh, under the First Amendment, the court said, as long as the law is neutral and generally applicable, it does not violate the free exercise clause. Just a general question, so I won't be offended if you don't answer it, but when it comes to... Try to offend me, it's very hard. When, when it comes to <laughs> establishing like a religion like Church of Cannabis or something like that, how do they go about doing that so that they can get taxes? Really hard. Um, so the better example is a Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster. That's a real one? It is. And part of their sacrament, their deity is, a, is basically a ball of spaghetti. It's a spaghetti monster. And part of their sacrament is that they wear a colander, a, a pasta strainer on their head. And, and their thing is they want to take driver's license photos wearing colanders on their head. And they've been able to actually persuade some judges that this is a legitimate, sorry, that this is a faith that's worth protecting. And um, they get to wear on their driver's license pictures colanders, you know, spaghetti strainers in their heads. Um, the other example you're probably thinking of is Scientology, which which is a, a well, not if you watch Netflix, right? Um, that that's a tougher question of how do you get tax exempt status. It, it's a it's a very hard question because the government doesn't want it to be in the business of saying you are a fake religion. Um, but there are churches which look a lot like for profit businesses. So even if you have religion. If the government determines that your primary purpose is raising money and not actually worshiping, they can yank it on those grounds, but not by saying that's a fake religion. Uh, yeah, Travis, Tyler. On the side note, I've been to one of those churches. It's like getting off. Have thank you. And uh, they do wear that on their head. They wear the columns, right? They don't risk getting everyone there while we call it. Pretty interesting people in that are. Well, I, I, I do not judge here. So, in the Smith case, one, one at a time, one at a time. So, in the Smith case, um, the court ruled against Smith. 
And the court ruled that as long as it's a law of general applicability, applies to all faiths, it's not unconstitutional. This decision, as you might imagine, proved very unpopular, right? How can you deny benefits to uh, uh, this Native American guy, Smith, because he's doing what his religion requires him to do? That's unfair. So Congress then enacts a law, a federal law, called RIFRA, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. Let me give you the acronym, RIFRA. And it's pronounced RIFRA, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. And at a very broad level, what RIFRA tried to do was to bring back the First Amendment before the Smith case, right? Restore what the Free Exercise Clause was before the Smith case. Um, how did they try to accomplish that? They basically said that if the government, state or federal, violates your free exercise rights, you can sue them. If the government violates your free exercise rights, you can sue them in federal court. Okay. Now, did you guys study Bernie v. City of Flores in con law? Yes. yes. What was the problem with RIFRA and Bernie. I promise we're going to get to the case for today, but I need this background to make sure you get it. What was the problem with the RIFRA and Bernie? Don't remember? Oh, very good. What's the problem with Congress allowing people to sue the state? What's the problem there? Generally speaking. Uh, I don't know. No, I think it's just a bad idea. It's kind of well, it might be a bad idea, but what's problematic about it? Yeah, Mark? Can Congress even do that? Can Congress allow a state to be sued? So the case arose, of course, in Texas, right? Where else are things? Every, every case we have is against in Texas, it seems, right? So we have St. Peter the Apostle Church in Bernie, Texas. Anyone know where this is? Yeah, has anyone ever been here? It's like outside of San Antonio. Yeah, I've had some students who attended there. So there was a church. Right outside San Antonio and Bernie, Texas. Uh, it's a beautiful church. You ever been inside? No, no, no. Okay, no. Okay, well, it's a beautiful church. And if you look inside, it's pretty big, but uh, not that big. So at the time, Archbishop Flores uh, sought a permit from the city of Bernie to expand the church. He wanted to make it bigger. He said, I have so many people coming to pray, we don't have room to put everyone. I need a bigger church. The city of Bernie denied the archbishop's request. They said, look, this is such a beautiful church. It's a historical site. We wouldn't want you to mess up with it, so you have to keep it exactly the same. Now, that's not a very good message for the priest or, uh, for the archbishop. He's like, look, I can't fit my people in this church. I need a bigger place. So usually we study zoning, right? You apply for a variance, right? You apply for a special exception. All that stuff was denied. You appeal up through the zoning process. Denied. Okay. Uh, who am I have to? Oh, let's get to you. Yeah. Let's <laughs> call on you. Uh, William, what would you usually do if you're the archbishop and you apply for a variant and get denied? You apply for a special exception and get denied. Everything gets denied. At that point, what are you going to do? I don't know. There's not really an option. There's not. Right? Under the normal course, when you go through the state court process, you keep losing, 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 you're done. You can't build your church. Aha. But RIFRA creates a new cause of action. Right? RIFRA said, ha, if the government violates your free exercise, you can sue them in federal court. Again, you did all of your stuff in state court, right? You saw a variance, you saw a hardship. But with RIFRA, there's no need to waste your time. You go straight to federal court and you say, the refusal to grant the zoning permit, the refusal to allow me to expand my church, harms my exercise right. I can't worship as I see fit because I can't fit my people into this building. Now, under the Smith case, this is a losing decision, right? They lose. Right? This zoning law is not simply a Catholic, it's a general zoning law saying, Historical sites can be modified. But under RIFRA, it goes beyond Smith. Now, to make a long story short, 
very long story. The Supreme Court struck down RIFRA in part. They say that RIFRA was unconstitutional because it violates state sovereignty, right? Congress, in this case, cannot allow the states to be sued, right? As a general matter, you can't sue the state. This is the 11th Amendment. Here, Congress lacked the power to waive or abrogate, if you want to use a fancy word, right? To waive or abrogate the state's sovereign immunity. Okay? So that is much less important than what comes next, right? Whether you just get what I said, I, I actually don't care. That's, that, that part's on the exam. What is in the exam is the next part, which is a buildup. After the Supreme Court struck down RIFRA in part as applied to the states, it enacted my favorite acronym in the US code, RILUPA. <laughs> Say it again. RILUPA, right? The Religious Land Use and Institutionalized Persons Act, RILUPA. Okay. What RILUPA tried to accomplish was to put the states back under the sort of RIFRA regime, right? But in specific context. Land use? Here, let me spell that. Religious Land Use and Institutionalized Persons Act. Let me spell that word, right? So if the case involves land use, or institutionalized persons, basically people in jail, right? In these scenarios, states now have a new restraint. That if they issue a land use decision, or if they make a decision concerning people in prison, they are bound by this restriction. Okay? Everyone with me so far? Right, so today, even today, 2017, if you represent a church, for example, and they apply for a building permit, and it gets denied, you can then see a federal lawsuit under RELUPA. However, if you run a, I don't know, a store, a commercial entity, and the same permit's denied, you can't avail yourself of RELUPA. So this is a special carve-out for free exercise cases and people in prisons. Okay? What was the theory behind adding the land use and the institutionalized persons? Ah, together? very good. Um, okay, I'll do it now. I'll do it in a couple of minutes. I'll do it now. RELUPA applies if, three, if one of three conditions are met. Right? And Lauren, this will answer your question, I promise. First, does a state program receive federal money? Okay. Does a state program receive federal money? Basically, all state programs receive federal money. It's not 100%, but it's probably close to it. The reason why this is important is because it involves the provision of the Constitution known as the Spending Clause, right? Remember the Spending Clause is coming back to you, right? The second half of this class is based mostly common law. I, I, I would consolidate property into just one and just do a separate class on land use, but not, not my decision. Um, under the Spending Clause, Congress can give money to the state with the condition of the tax, strings attached, right? Remember this? So they say, here, we're giving you money, but when you make a land use decision, we're going to put strings attached to it. So it's not everything, it's specific sorts of decisions involving land use. So first, if the state accepts federal money. Second, if there's a substantial burden by the local law on interstate commerce. Okay? This is the Commerce Clause, right? That the state engages in some activity that is a concern. Substantial effect commerce, then you're bound by review law. So what Congress is trying to do here is target things you can get at directly that don't affect the state's sovereign immunity. Okay?
And the final one, and this is the one that's at issue in our case today, is when the government makes what's called an individualized assessment in land use. That is, they deny your zoning permit, right? And that implicates the free exercise clause. You don't need to understand the reasons why these apply. That's more of a common law issue, but these are the three justifications for why the law applies. One of the three have to apply. All right, let's do the facts of the case. I think uh, I think you're next, Taylor. Want to give us the facts, please? Sure. Um, By the way, I was at game six last week. <laughs> <laughs> Yankees fan, not so happy. But I'm okay with Houston now. Now, 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 now we're cool. We're cool now. We're cool, we're, we're cool now. We're cool now. Uh, it, it was a rough go. I was I was at the game on Friday. It was not a happy night. That was a bad game. It was, it, it was tough. Uh, but anyway, Taylor, go ahead. I, I saw your teacher invited yeah. me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, the Guru Monarch yeah. um, is a non profit organization that wants to build a Sikh temple. And at first, he applies to build a temple on his own property. Good. And they deny that. And Good. He buys an agricultural um, piece of land. And he applies to build it there. And they deny that as well. <coughs> And he brings that this is a substantial burden on his um, ability to tax people. Okay, very good. So the facts here are such, right? You have a religious group. They want to build a temple. They first try and do it in a low-density area. And the government says you have to apply for conditional use permit. Bradley, oh man, this is your question. <laughs> that was not deliberate. Bradley, what's the difference? Tell me, please. Repeat what I told you an hour ago between a conditional use permit and a variance. That's worth the not liberty. The cosmic universe. The conditional, the conditional use is predictable. Okay. The is unpredictable. So what sort of conditions have to be met to get a conditional use permit, in this case at least? Uh, well, in, in this case? Yeah, yeah, in this case. Let's talk about, talk about well, this case. Like, they were complaining about noise and traffic. Um, so it was like the temples were traditionally permitted in AG districts, which I figured meant agricultural. Yep. So they they like they didn't want the noise of the temple, but then they wanted them to move to agricultural. Then there was issues with that. So yeah. So very it's good. A Goldie so look, Goldilocks. Issue Bingo. That wasn't going to happen. Very good. Someone's paying attention. Very good, right? Goldilocks, right? <laughs> so first, he wants to build it in the in the in the city, right? They say, oh no, no, you can't build it in the city because it'll be too close to the people. There'll be too much noise and congestion, right? They say, okay, go build it out in the ag area, right? In the agricultural area. So, oh no, no, if you build it out there, it's too far. This is what's called leapfrog zoning. You know what I this phrase? Leapfrog. They don't want things like far apart. They want you know close nearby so people can drive along the way. So you can't build it in the city. You can't build it outside the city. Where can you build it? So you can imagine that the, 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 the Sikhs here were not very happy. And they basically bought all these properties. They bought a 28 acre lot, which that's a pretty big lot, right? 28 acres, didn't border anyone's property. Um, they said, look, we'll keep everything indoors. We'll put a buffer zone, we'll have landscaping. Uh, and then of course, I used to call them busybodies, right? The neighbors came out saying, oh, no, no, we, we can't have this. There's too much noise and traffic. It'll interfere with the agricultural values or the property values. And then a 4-3 vote, can you imagine? It's like a Supreme Court, like a 4-3 to three decision, right, of the plan division. Uh, 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 grants it. But then the neighbors appealed. And then the Board of Supervisors reversed it unanimously. So in other words, they exhausted, I think, every conceivable route. They exhausted every conceivable route to get their permit. So they turned to federal court. Right? Uh, Sarita, what what was their argument then in federal court here? So they argued that, um, so since they had to show what the substantial burden was, they argued that since they tried um, every 
possible way um, that they're, they weren't willing to give like another opportunity and that was their major uh, right to exercise their religion. Yeah, very good. So you can imagine, right, you're the city lawyer, right? You're the lawyer for this county. And you say, well, you know, why are they going to federal court now? Let them just request another conditional use permit. Go apply for permits. Purchase a third location, right? Alex, what's your response if you're the lawyer for the for the uh, for the Sikhs here, right? If they say, yeah, just go find a third or a fourth location. Keep keep trying. Keep banging your head against the wall, right? What's your response there? No. So yes, no. <laughs> why, why no? Why is your answer no? Uh, because it seems like they're just like they keep making moves, like they're not gonna eventually give in and let them build it. And, and why does that run afoul of Relupa in particular, right? It's unfair. Everyone agrees it's unfair. But why is that a, a, a violation of federal law? Because they're religious um, issues. Well, they are. But what, what is this moving the goalpost doing to their to their free exercise? Let me ask the question like that. It's unfair. How? Because... No, you're right there. You're right there. Say, finish it. I think you're, right, you're almost there. How is this sort of game of Goldilocks, right? They're violating their free exercise rights. Because they're never going to be able to meet what they need to do. Yeah. They want to build their temple. They want to have a place for them to worship. Right? They can't worship if they can't build a place. And if the government keeps giving them a million excuses of why you can't build here and you can't build there, go here, try this, they'll never be able to exercise. They say, wait, why, why, why do they need a church or a temple to exercise? Why can't they just worship in their basement, right? Why can't they just do it in their backyard? Why do they need a special place? The purpose of Reliupa is so that those questions don't get asked. In the normal course of zoning, you say, well, if you want to build a McDonald's, I don't know, right? You want to build a McDonald's and you can't build it here, you can't build it there, what's the burden of looking for a third location? But they're not building a Mickey D's here, right? They're building a house of worship. And because of this federal law, when you're building a house of worship, special rules apply. And the burden then becomes a burden on the government. Saying, look, you're, you're putting this burden on the free exercise. Why are you doing this? What's the reason why you're making it so difficult? And unless you have a good reason why you keep denying these permits, you're going to lose. And that's the effect of Ryupa. Under usual zoning laws, the plaintiff, the builder, has all the burden, all the difficulties. But here with Lupa, at a certain point, the burden shifts to the government, right? You're giving them a burden, why? You're messing their exercise rights, why? And so Valerie, what reason does the government actually give here to explain why they're, you know, what's their interest in doing this and making their lives so difficult? Maybe give a good reason at all. Not just that. What? And just like continuously change do they give any reason? No. Yeah, that's the answer, right? They gave zero reason. The court says the city has no compelling interest. Zero. Right? This is the standard, right? What's your interest in doing this? The government has none. At this point, it seems to be completely arbitrary the reason why they keep dumping uh, this permit and that permit around. Okay? So... The, the application, and again, this is only a circuit court opinion of the Ninth Circuit, but the circuit court opinion here, I think, is a pretty good application of Remupa, right? If you're going to deny a building permit for a religious entity in a way that burdens their exercise, you better have a good reason, right? You better have a neutral reason why you're denying this building permit. If your reason is just because of noise, that's probably not going to cut it. If your reason is, you know, we don't want to have leapfrog development, that's probably not going to cut it either. You need to give an actual reason why you're not going to allow this to be built. So again, it's a circuit court opinion, um, but I think it's a fairly good application. The Supreme Court actually, to this date, I don't think they've actually considered a case involving the land use part, right? The Supreme Court considered review part in the institutionalized persons part, but they haven't considered the land use part, although I don't think this, this holding is any any different. Jesse? Is it the reason it's pretty compelling to so it's for two? Yeah. It's not just any interest, right? They have to give compelling interest of why. Right? Here the government gives zero, right? 
This is a case where if you listen to the arguments, I haven't listened, I'm sure, the, the, justice, the judges were asking, you know, so what's your reason for doing this? Uh, 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 zoning and uh, police power and noise. And like, well, is that compelling? Uh, no, I don't know why, right? Because here, the, 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 the temple said, we will take mitigating measures, right? We'll have, imagine, a 28-acre lot with a little temple in the middle, right? We'll hold the ceremonies indoors. Is there any conceivable basis whereby the noise will then spread 28 acres away? No, right? No. This is not like they're building like, you know, a, a party hall in the middle of the downtown area. It's a pretty remote location. Bradley? It may be misunderstanding the law, um, but why does it only include it? Because when I think of institutionalized, I didn't think like we were all institutionalized, but I was thinking institution like university and colleges. Uh, this might be an institution, but not that sort. Um, it, it, uh, it generally, institutionalizing people can't leave. Uh, thankfully, you are free to leave this room. I wouldn't recommend it, but you are you are indeed free to leave. Um, this means people were committed, maybe in, in, a, in a, a, a asylum is the wrong word, which is like a home where people are basically institutionalized for, for mental health conditions. They, they can't check out unless the government says so. I think that's what they're talking about here. I, and I understand that. I'm, I'm wondering why we also include, like, if we're including churches and then prisons and mental hospitals, if you will, why not include, like, colleges? Um, that's why I'm saying I might be misunderstanding the point of the law. Uh, so, so generally, so, so state institutions are going to be bound uh, by the First Amendment, right? So, but the, the government traditionally takes some of a hands-off approach to educational institutions, so it's not surprising. But if any school accepts federal money, they're bound in more ways than you can imagine. So there are like only two colleges in the U.S. that accept federal money, maybe Hillsdale and maybe one other. So. Schools are plenty much restricted what they can do. Uh, yes, Anna? Um, when we're talking about substantial burden, are these, I guess, are they considered unique, or would it not be a substantial burden if there was another church in the same town? Well, that's actually the facts of this case, right? Did they mention there was another seat, a temple in this area? Mm -hmm. um, Again, I don't think a state would have compelling interest to say, ah, you can only have one seat temple in a given jurisdiction, right? I don't think that would fly. Because, um, I mean, even among a given faith, in different strands, different leaders, people like, different, you know, different, different uh, doctrines are practiced. So I think it would be uh, a problematic, ah, you can go to this temple, it's going to be another temple, right? I think so. I, I, and I think the fact that there was, um, again, the people here spent a lot of money buying this land, right? The fact that they were willing to do this shows that there was an interest in demand for, for a second temple in this region. I, I suspect, I mean, I don't know. I, I, I haven't checked. Anything else on, on the uh, Guru Nanak case? So, if you ever in, um, oh, Kelly, yes, ma'am. Um, her question, if you couldn't hear it, is where will Yupa apply if it had a substantial effect in interstate commerce? I'll get back to you. I've only seen it applied in land use cases and cases involving prisoners. I haven't seen it applied elsewhere. I, it, it probably has. I'm not sure, but I'll check on that. Thank yeah, you. Like revival type stuff? What do you mean? Revival, like where you know, oh. missionary churches are traveling to state to state. The, the problem is what... And I, uh, okay, what would they be seeking permission to do, right? If you move moving from state to state, you're probably not building anything. Convention center? Yeah. Well, if it's a state convention center, then, then if they're saying, let's say, okay, let's say a convention center won't allow a Christian revival church to come in, right? That's a free exercise problem. It's also a free speech problem because it's content-based restriction. So it's probably more of a speech issue than an exercise issue. I don't know. I, I, I haven't thought that. I'll, I'll check later. I'm not sure. Any other questions in the first case? Uh, yeah, Robert. Sorry, real quick. Um, in my notes, I have for a variance you must prove a serious hardship. But we keep using the word under the COP for a substantial burden. Should I think it means the same? No. 
No, no. No, no. You'll confuse yourself. The word burden under Rupa is not the same as the word hardship under Mary. Okay. Good, good thing. Anything else in the second case in Guru Nanak? All right, let's do the last case. The last case is an oldie but a goodie. Um, it's called a Village of Belterra before us. Um, who am I to? Uh, okay, Natalie, want to give me the facts here, please? Yes, uh, there was a city ordinance that said um, you can't have too many unrelated people living together. There was a group of six people who were unrelated and lived together, so they violated. Right, so Natalie, it's 1974, right? Why do you think this statute was enacted? Why don't you take a wild guess? Um, what was going on in the 70s? Were there hippies? Hippies, thank you, yes, yes. <laughs> and I'm not making this up. There was actually a case decided a year before or a year after this one called uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture versus Moreno which involved basically hippies abusing the food stamp program, right? So you're basically a commune where all these people would live together and they'd, they'd pull the food stamps. And I swear, if you go to the Supreme Court transcript, the word hippie is in there, right? It's in there, I promise you. So right, so, so what happened was, this was in Belterra, Long Island, which was a fairly small town, only 700 odd people. It's, it's basically one square mile, right? If you want to look at it on a map, it, it's, it's, a very, it's a very small region, right? Um, right over here, it's very small. And they enact an ordinance that limits the number of non-related people who could live together. Um, there are exceptions for housekeepers, right? That, that's a different story. But for people who live there, it limited to more two unrelated people. That's what happens. The Dickmans own a house. He leads to Truman. Boras moves in. Then Anne moves in. And they all start moving in. Before you know it, all these college students are living in this small house. The village serves them notice saying you are in violation of our ordinance. And the students file a federal lawsuit challenging this. Okay? Um, we have to remember about this because the Supreme Court decided in the Euclid case back in the 1920s that the government can institute land use regulations, right? Remember the pig in the parlor, right? That they control the aesthetics of a uh, property. This case, though, is different. Right? This is not about how big a property can be, or how many feet it must be, or what the zoning is. This is how many people could live in the house. Philip, what does Justice Douglas do here for the majority? Uh, they, um, they uphold the uh, ordinance. Uh, they, they say that they're, um, they say that they're it's constitutional. OK, why? Uh, because you can, the, the government's police power allows them to uh, eliminate like, like filth and unsanitary conditions and you know, world, world Filth? Is that what you're calling hippies? Filth? Is that what you're saying? That's not what I'm saying. <laughs> That's what Douglas is saying. <laughs> that is absolutely what Douglas is saying. I'm glad you, glad you framed like that. Yeah, you're right. Um, basically, what Justice Douglas says here is that the government has the right to eliminate filth and disgusting things in your jurisdiction. And having all these people crowd into this house is disgusting. Now, I think, Kayla, okay, we'll, we'll try and do a little bit more charitable, right? What are the problems with too many people living in a property? Like putting aside their, their hygiene, right? We're not talking about that now. What's a, a generalized problem having a lot of people living in a single property? Um, I don't know, they might have like cars. Cars, yeah. I mean, in Houston, that's a legitimate problem. Each person who lives here, Probably at time. They had a VW bus, you know it, right? But but in theory, at least, right? You have a lot of people. You have a lot of cars. Increases traffic, right? But Kayla, why is this justification about traffic not very persuasive? Why why does that really make sense here in the context of the uh, of the ordinance issue? I guess because you can limit it. Like you could say, like only two vehicles. Yeah. Right. Wouldn't it be a lot easier instead of saying you can't live together? They only have two cars, right, per permit, per location. Simone, what's another problem with this ordinance that it doesn't really make sense, right? They're really concerned about the number of cars. What? What? Well, why is this ordinance not tailored to that problem? Because I'm thinking about the 
hospital. Yeah. Are not exactly. Related. I mean, that are related. Exactly. That's okay. Yeah, so I gave the Brady Bunch, right? <laughs> 1970s movie today, right? Um, you have, you know, 15 people living in the house with poor cousin Oliver disappeared to nowhere, right? Um, <laughs> what happens? <laughs> you know, what happens there? Everyone gets a car. They're all related. They got married. They're not living in sin, right? They have a car. If you have tw the entire Brady Bunch driving, even a little Alice, right? Everyone has a car. That's not a problem. But here, they're only concerned about unrelated people. So, Chester, again, does this ordinance sound like the sort of thing that was actually designed to limit traffic, limit cars? Is that, is that why they enacted this ordinance? No, they had ulterior motives. Okay, they have ulterior motives. I think Simone and Kayla said that. Does it matter to the majority that these ulterior motives existed? Uh, no, it doesn't matter about the motives. They still find a way to rationalize it. Ah, rationalize it. What, what, what's this rational stuff you're talking about? Um, well, reportedly, uh, the court says that uh, it's, not con it's not unconstitutional because they find the word family and what that was supposed to entail. Um, so I guess they just found some baseline understanding to get the ordinance through. Very good. Very good. So that's right. The short answer is they apply what we call rational basis review, right? It's the notion that when you're reviewing these sorts of laws involving the police power, you only review it for rationality. That is, it doesn't matter whether the reason given is the actual reason, ulterior motives, these Chester's words. What matters is, could this have been a rational reason for doing it, right? Could they have enacted this ordinance to cut down on traffic and number of cars? Yeah, they could have. That's enough for Douglas, right? To get rid of this filth, don't have people, right? But to get rid of the filth in the community, they can use this. Um, beyond just hippies, the problem is more fraternity houses, right? This was in a college town in Long Island, and there was a fear that they would have basically the equivalent of frat houses popping up in their, in their local community. and you know what goes on in frat houses, right? Drinking, drugs. Whoa, 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 whoa. This is the 70s, man. I was, I was, what, what did Robin Williams say? If you remember the 70s, you weren't there. Uh, I suppose that, that's true enough. Um, but the government is legitimately concerned. And what Justice Douglas says is, it is ample to lay out zones where family values, youth values, and the blessings of quiet seclusion and clean air makes the area sanctuary for people, not college students, I suppose. <laughs> okay. So any questions in the Douglas majority? Uh, yes, Jesse. In Moreno and the other case about the disabled people who live near the school, wasn't a high rational case in the project? They did, they did. This case, I, I often explain it, is that the justices didn't want hippies living next door to them, right? They perhaps sympathized for the, um, uh, the, 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 the Cleburne case you mentioned with the, uh, the mental retardation home and the uh, uh, Moreno case also, but here, Justice Douglas loved zoning. He loved keeping filth out of his neighborhood. He loved cleanliness. He did not want these people living next door. I, I think that's, that's, that's the answer for your question. All right, Walker. What's Justice Marshall's dissent here? Lonely dissent. Didn't even get Brennan, just by oh, himself. I'm not sure. Oh, you almost made it, too. You almost made it. A minute left. You said um, he said that it does violate the freedom of association and um, like right of privacy, so it does. What's this freedom of association? You said right to establish your home, like who you want in your home, and like where you want your home. Right. So, so Justice Marshall's opinion is actually very easy to explain. Right. That the First Amendment protects. I have it up here. Um, by the way, Long Island is not Staten Island. People confuse them. They're not the same thing. Um, the First Amendment has this phrase, the right of the people to peacefully assemble. There is no actual clause in the Constitution saying the right of free association. The Supreme Court made that up. But it's pretty well established, right? This right of free association, that you can associate with whomever you wish. And what Marshall's saying is, who is the government to say that people need to get married to live together, right? That if they want to be unassociated, unaffiliated, unmarried, children of love and peace, living in harmony in this lovely home, uh, they can do so. So Justice Marshall would find that this was an unconstitutional violation of the freedom of association. 
Uh, he also mentions this right of privacy, which you no doubt is like common law, that people have the right to choose who they associate with. But uh, Justice Marshall is all alone in his uh, dissenting opinion. There's another case mentioned, I want to mention it briefly in your reading, called Moore v. City of East Cleveland, decided a couple years later in 1977. And this decision, in large part, limits Belterra. And the facts of the case were actually very different. You basically had a grandma that could not live with her grandchild. So while Belterra concerned unrelated people, Moore concerned related people. And what the court said is, you can't regulate the specific contours of a family, right? You can prohibit unrelated people from living together, but you can't decide what a nuclear family ought to look like. That, that was a violation of substantive due process under the 14th Amendment. Um, that was a 5-4 decision, and at least four of the justices would have allowed um, the city to regulate the types of family members that can live together. So no Belterra but also know uh, more of East Cleveland, which will give you a little segment after your book. So questions on Belterra or Horace? All right, let me, let me summarize a bit for, for today. Um, as, a, as a general matter, zoning laws are very broad, and the government can do usually whatever damn well pleases under the auspices of the police power. Uh, but there are certain exceptions. One exception is First Amendment free speech. And if you have a law that discriminates on the basis of content, it's unconstitutional. Um, another element is the free exercise of religion. And under RELUPA, which applies to virtually every jurisdiction in the country, an individualized land use decision that imposes a substantial burden on religion is probably going to be illegal. Not necessarily, but probably going to be illegal. Uh, but then you have the other clause, the right of free association. Um, there, the court in Belterra didn't give it much weight, only Justice Marshall would have, but you still have this substantive due process right to associate with the family members of your choice. Okay, any other questions on that? Okay, I will see you all on Tuesday. Thank you very much.